I'm here with Ron Rayfield, I'm Justine Dorn, and we are about to sit here and have a really good meal. I'd be lying to you if I didn't say that I already ate a lot of it, <laughs> so I can tell you it's really good. It this smells good. It smells really good. It tastes really good. This is a dish from 1820, but you can make this in any time period. It's so simple. It's called beef callops in gravy, which is, at the time, callops were kind of like little cuts of beef, kind of like a thin steak, and then we just cooked it with onions, salt, pepper, in a gravy. And that's it. And it's so simple, so good. We're gonna eat it. <laughs> Ron. You want me to serve you up? Yes, could you serve me up? Uh, I think we need a spoon, don't we? Use fork. Well, okay, for the well, gravy, maybe we've got a spoon. Here. It's storming today. It is storming. All right. Let's speak. Can you get a plate, please? Mm -hmm. These are tender and flavorful one? and good. Oh, yeah, I definitely want another one. That's. Oh, that's good. <laughs> Want some gravy on it? Yeah. A little extra. Mm-hmm. <laughs> bread? Yeah, I definitely do want bread. Two pieces. Thank you. I was contemplating toasting the bread before, but no. I'm okay with it, I'm how okay it is. Mm-mm-mm. <laughs> <laughs> Teamwork makes the dream work. That's right. It helps us to eat too. <laughs> there you go. I will take two pieces of bread as well. And we also have a salad. It's just Ooh. spinach. <laughs> there's spinach and there's a little bit of cheese in there. That's good for nothing. Spinach is in season in spring. We try to always eat seasonal foods. Oh yeah, I like I like pepper on my salads. I like pepper on everything though. Me too. Yeah, we like pepper. And we just have a simple dressing here of oil, vinegar, salt. Mix it up. And slash it. Mm hmm And they were pretty big on eating salads back then too. But only during certain times of the month. Nowadays you can just buy a bag of salad whenever you want, <laughs> including in winter. But back then it was only for uh, late spring and summertime you could get a salad. Well, let me say grace for Yes, please. Lord, thank you for the food. Thank you for our safety and our good health. Amen. Amen, thank you. We'll see one for that. He don't hat. like his hat. I told him, wear your hat. He don't like it. He also don't like his new waistcoat. Mm. You don't like it? It looks like a rug. No, it don't look like a rug. You look great. I think my grandma had the same rug in her living room <laughs> in the 70s. <laughs> the 1770s. The 1770s. About. <laughs> yeah. I think you look great. Well, that's funny. I wonder if back then, if they were like, you know, back in the 80s. Oh, they were. Yada, yada, yada. No, they definitely were because there were satirical prints that would make fun of old people for wearing 18th century clothes, even in the 1820s. Like wearing tricorn hats, even in the 1820s. So or... I would have got made fun of them. Yeah, basically. He's super stubborn about his tricorn hat. <laughs> I mean, his dad, his dad wore it in the war and gave it to him, and he wants to wear it, but it's considered awfully old fashioned. Well, the funny thing is. We think of 1980s, everybody had mm -hmm. big hair. Mm -hmm. Back then, in the 1780s, everybody everyone had, had big, big hair. hair. And even the 1880s, everybody had like right. big bushy beards. Right. There's something about the 80s and hair that... I wonder what it was like in the 1680s. I need to look at that, see if they had big hair. It, every 200 or 100 years, <laughs> it just comes around again. Yeah, every... The big hair and everything. <laughs> Mm, mm, yeah, mm. if you had big hair by this period, by 1820, you were dreadfully old-fashioned. This is so good. I know. This one is a keeper. And it's very easy to make. 
So, I would say... This might be the best thing we've ever made in here. Get out. They're all good, but this... Really? This is good. It is really good. Okay, what were you saying? I was gonna say that if you guys only can make two things for my channel, trying out actual 200 year old dishes at home, the easiest are the sausages and apples. That's the easiest one. And I've had the most people tell me that they've made that out of any video. And also this one. Very easy and very good by the modern palette. Good. Mm -hmm. mm. What a meal. That'd be good with rice too. Yeah. You like rice with everything. I like rice with everything. That's <laughs> <laughs> the Middle Eastern Indian. Mm-hmm. We eat rice with everything. It's true. This is good. With bread too, it's good. Mm. I'm challenging the salad right now. Mm -hmm. I like fresh spinach. Spinach is very good for you. As long as your kidneys are working good. Yeah. <laughs> So, what was I gonna say? Oh yeah. I don't know. <laughs> Thank you, everybody that came to Pioneer Days. We met people oh, yeah. from all over, and it wasn't even it wasn't even an early American event. You all just no. came to meet us, and we felt grateful Honored. and grateful and. I did not think that was gonna happen. I thought it was just gonna be Pioneer Days. I thought it was yeah. just gonna be we're trying to help Candy out again because she's our adoptive grandma. Grandma, she's the same age as her parents. She's our adopted aunt. Is she really the same age as her parents? Yeah. She's only like 55. Oh, well then What do yeah. you think she was, 70? Sorry, Candy, if you're watching this. You know, I'm defending I, you, she's not. I thought that she just looked really good for her age. <laughs> well, anyway, whatever. As I was saying, um, so I thought we were just gonna help Candy out and help her with this event. Ron and Candy set it up to get more people to come to the shop. And because it's in the grassy field behind her store, I did not expect people to come and drive all that way to see us. There's, there was a, a really nice family from Arkansas. Their name escapes me because I, I talked to about 50 people from who were fans of the show, but their whole family dressed up like, uh, I'm going to say, Little House on the was Prairie. Was that the off-grid family? Yeah. If, you, if you're watching. If you guys are watching, you are my inspiration. They're really have, doing it. Yeah, they're really doing it. I want to yeah. live off-grid. And they have a whole beautiful family. Beautiful kids, just everyone there was like something from a picture book. It was perfect. Yeah. <laughs> we first seen them when we were on the horse carriage Beautiful ride. Beautiful people. And they were waving at us and then they came through our mm -hmm. camp and talked to us. Very nice. Uh, our two, I'm gonna call them our super fans. They've come to St. Genevieve a few times. Yep. Uh, mother and the son, mm -hmm. Michael and Lee. Lee. Can I pronounce you guys' last names? Don't be offended. <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, you guys are awesome. They showed up dressed up like us. Did, uh, they, they went and got real clothes. Yeah, and they it was came. Awesome. They came in early 19th century clothes, and they rocked it. Yeah, they looked good. I mean, when they they walked up, they're like, "Hey, Ron," and I just thought they were somebody else. I was like, "Hey," and I was like, "Wait a minute." <laughs> we just because we just seen them a week prior, and they were in you know, 20 21st century clothes. And, and I think that's the first time they ever put on those clothes. I think so. It was really cool. Mhm. Mm um, talked to a really not a lot of nice people. Mhm. Mm um, some people gave us some really cool gifts. The lady that brought the egg box for us. The mysterious. Was there. Egg box. Be careful. Yeah, it's full of eggs, so I'm gonna be careful. You guys remember this? Yep. <laughs> this mysterious egg box. The lady who gave it to us, she was there as well. Yep. She lives in Illinois. And I'm pretty sure it's an egg box. <laughs> yeah, it's got something to do with it. It's, like... it's tapered up here. I can't tilt it, obviously, to show you. The eggs will fall out, but it's tapered to fit an egg. <laughs> it's definitely not a pipe holding no, box. There's it's no not. way. Or a candle box. There's no way. Yeah, that would be a very strange. Yeah, it's pipe box. Impossible. But... Because whatever it is, it's meant to sit directly on here because it's tapered. Mm -hmm. And I was telling Ron, I honestly think that this was not a mass-produced item. I, I just think it's something that some guy, maybe a hundred years ago, or who knows how old it is, he's just a woodworker, and his wife asked him, hey, can you make me this very specific item? I want an egg box and you can put napkins on the bottom, and he made it for her. And now, that's it. Now, Candy had an interesting 
theory on that. I don't remember what they're called. The only problem is, well, I'll tell you what her theory is. Her theory is it's for putting light under the edge so you can see if it's fertilized right. or not. But the gap is so small, you can never get a candle in there and it would catch on fire. The egg would just go. Yeah. <laughs> so we have no idea. Maybe a kid made it. And for a project. Yeah, and it was just a mm -hmm. whatever. But anyways, right. that lady was there. There was a really nice gentleman um, named Rick. Mm -hmm. Rick Frederick, or, mm -hmm. or wait, sorry, his name is Frederick, but he goes by Rick, and his last name's Hayden. Uh, very nice man, he's from Maine. He's actually a member of the uh, militias up in uh, Massachusetts, and he does the 12 mile, I believe it's called the Patriot March for the- uh, 12 miles. They they reenact when the, the world, the shot heard around the world took place, and that's really cool. And so we have to meet him. He, he brought us a really neat trivet that he made. Uh, very nice fellow. And everybody else is just really nice. It was really nice to meet you all. It was very nice. And uh, Candy was just as excited mm -hmm. to meet everybody too. So. Right. And and you guys got some of you guys got to meet Dale. Um, <laughs> Dale was next to me. And then uh, Mr. Jeff, he was there a few times, and some of you took pictures with him. <laughs> so, anyways, thank you for coming to Pioneer Days. Mm -hmm. And if you want to see this being made, go to Early American. Over there, we cook it. Here we eat it. Here we eat it. <laughs> This is good. This is good. Good, simple, natural, food of the earth type meal. Yep. Could I have the knife, please? Thank you. And at the event, that is the very first time I've ever autographed anything. Yeah. No one's ever asked me to autograph anything before. I find a book. I signed a book too. And I didn't, we didn't even write the book. No, it was just, uh, it was a copy of a, a cookbook published in 1805. It was Amelia Simmons. We, yep, that we were selling. Or maybe it was Hannah, it was either Hannah no, Glass No, it wasn't Amelia. Hannah Glass. Okay, it was blue, that's all I remember. It was a blue book from 1805. Yep. I think it was called The Art of Cookery Made Plain and Easy, but I could be wrong. Maybe that was it. He just wanted our autograph because we cooked out of it. and. Yep. Oh, we signed it. Yeah, we signed it. The only thing I've ever autographed before are checks to pay bills. Yeah. So that was really cool. <laughs> Thank you again, everyone, for coming down. Mm -hmm. It was a good, a good day, a good weekend. Yeah. The weather held out for us. <laughs> if you all looking for something to do, we'll mm -hmm. see you at Fort Bichard in two weeks. The first week in the June. And that's a real big event. Oh, the yeah. one we had in the backyard at Candy Shop is just a small town gathering. Yeah, about 25 the different tents set up, but there'll be 500 tents set up at, <laughs> at Fort Bouchard. Yeah. <laughs> it's a good time though. Well, how you liking it? Still uh, like it? I like this. <laughs> this is good. I would make this at least once or twice a month, really. It's really good. I like mm -hmm. the salad too. That dressing is really good that you made. Yeah, simple. I like vinegary foods. <laughs> so I like vinegar based dressings. Well, we had a tree come down yesterday and the big storms that come through here in Missouri. Right. Big tree, probably 16, 18 inches wide. Thankfully it didn't hit anything though. Yeah. <laughs> All the other trees were sideways. Mm -hmm. Lots of rain, lots of lightning. <clears throat> Back then, I mean, all you got is your cellar and your prayers, that's it. There's right. no warning system. And back then they call them whirlwinds. Yeah. Oh, there's a whirlwind coming. Gotta right. get to the root cellar. I guess they didn't have the word tornado yet. I don't know. I don't know where the word tornado comes from. Maybe it's a Spanish influence word? Tornado? I don't know. I don't know. I'm not sure. Comment below if you know. Yeah. I, I tried looking it up. It, it's hard to find those things. Uh, I tried to find some articles for Missouri weather disasters back then, but it, it stops at 1880. Anything before that, they have it photocopied, so you have to go in person mm -hmm. and request to see it at these archives places. And, and they're not around here. Yeah, for some reason, they're 
in what is it? Uh, so the ones from Missouri, for the Missouri Gazette, while Missouri was a territory from, I think the Gazette started in like 1795, mm -hmm. something like that, and then it went to the 1830s, all their documents are in Kansas at some archive museum place in mm -hmm. Kansas. And they're all on microfilm, which I, I think that's some kind of projector thing, like mm -hmm. on the reel. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I guess the originals don't exist, or but they should photocopy that stuff because no matter what you're looking for, it makes it a lot easier for research. Plus, just in case the originals get lost or yeah. in a fire or something, it's good to have an electronic backup. I know a lot of museums are slowly starting to convert some of their documents to electronic. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, print off a new copy and put it on the display. I, I'd rather see a physical copy than read a screen, but make a new copy of it. And Offer it for <laughs> sale? Oh, if you want to buy it. It would be cool mm -hmm. to buy old newspapers from, from, our, of it. from our time period, which is very hard to get a hold of. But anyways, the only one that I could really find was, and I'm going to get the date wrong on this, in August, <clears throat> when the British uh, burned down the White House mm -hmm. in the War of 1812, mm -hmm. a tornado happened. Now, some people say it was a hurricane, but other people say it was a tornado. So they say a tornado happened, it Ew. helped oh. put out the flames of the White House, and it killed some of the British soldiers. I mean, that sounds like divine intervention. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's insane. That's something only from a dream. That during a war, there's a massive storm that puts out the fire mm -hmm. and then kills the other opponent's side. I mean, well, it's like in the Revolutionary War, there was a layer of thick mm -hmm. fog, and Washington and his men were able to escape. And then the fog lifted, it, and then the British seen that they were destroyed. wow. It, it it made like a cover for them. See, stuff like that really makes you believe in God. Oh, he's real. I know, but I'm just saying like to people out there that it sounds like divine intervention steered it in a certain direction, don't it? <laughs> it just does. It's amazing. I mean, they, fact really is stranger than fiction. Some of the things that have happened in the past, if you really do research and look into it, history is incredible. And the history that they teach in most schools is not incredible, it's boring. <laughs> They'll just get up there and say, oh, the battle of 1785, this happened, blah, blah, blah. Hmm. But then they don't get into the real amazingness of the stuff that happened. All he teaches, Lincoln's on the five dollar bill, Jefferson's on the two. I know Benjamin's on the hundred. Yep. <laughs> he's, yeah. in, he's in a good place. <laughs> well, it's just very boring how they teach it. That's why kids aren't into history. That's why these things like we do on local events, you know, we try to appeal. We're there to have fun, but we're also there to do a job. And that's an appeal to younger folks to try to get them interested or at least teach them something. Right. Mm. I mean, this might surprise you, but when I was in school, history class was not really that interesting to me. Because I always had those teachers. I always had the ones that just got up there and gave a boring lecture from the textbook. Yeah, lectures are And it just kind of went in one ear and out the other, and I'd just sit there daydreaming about, oh, when I go home, I want to do this, and I want to do that. And that's all I thought about, or, oh, what am I going to do at lunch with my friends, you know? Right. I mean... It wasn't until my, my dad is the one that really got me in history, because he actually took me to these old historical sites, because I grew up mainly in Germany. Mm -hmm. So he would take me to these 18th century old houses and even earlier old cathedrals and old cemeteries and these cobblestone streets that looked like something out of Beauty and the Beast. <laughs> and that's what got me in history. Well, that's where they're losing kids. I remember when I was in high school around 2008 and uh, it, it was boring, like you said, it was lectures, and mm -hmm. here's a list of terms, and here's a definition. Memorize it. That's not learning history. Mm -hmm. That's that's learning to memorize something. That's not teaching you history. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there's so much history, especially here in St. Genevieve, that they don't teach, at least when I was in school. It could be different now, but... Uh, 
there's there's history in all periods uh, throughout American history here in oh, St. Yeah. Genevieve, and they don't teach it. And they don't even have to take a field trip. You take a field day, you can walk down to the house. It's three blocks from the Catholic school and about four blocks from the public school here in town. And, and that, they won't take them. I don't know why they don't do it. It does not make any sense to me at all. Because those old 18th and early 19th century houses are open to the public. <laughs> about half of them are open to the public. And the schools around here won't take their kids on field trips to see it. I mean, mm -hmm. if I'd known that 60 men from St. Jimmy fought in the Revolutionary War, that there would spark your interest a little bit. That really happened. Otherwise, you don't care about it because, one, it happened so long ago, and, oh, two, it was all the way over on the East Coast. We're mm -hmm. in the middle of America. Mm -hmm. So they don't care. They're kids. So if you got something to relate them with locally, they might be a little more into it, mm -hmm. regardless of what that is. Right. Anyway, this is good, and this is gonna all be gone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not gonna last. No, this is not gonna last. I mean, even cowboy stuff happened in St. Genevieve. Jesse James, the the outlaw bandit, they robbed the bank in St. Genevieve. Yep. We we went past that on our carriage What ride. is it with Merrimack Caverns? That's where his hideout was. Jesse James had a hideout here, in a cave. I'm That's sorry. maybe an hour and a half from here, tops, something like maybe that. like an hour, Merrimack Caverns. <laughs> and I took a tour through there. That guy was insane. He, I mean, the cave is absolutely massive. It looks like Batman's hangout. And there's all these waterfalls inside of it. And he jumped into the stream to escape from a group of people coming after him. And he left his horse down there. And there was no flashlights back then. No, so it must have been pitch black. And he just went in this cave with this tight tunnel with flowing a flowing stream under it. And he just prayed that he would make it out, I guess. And he did. See, fact is stranger than fiction. <laughs> There's so many amazing stories that need to be told that have happened in the United States and in other countries as well, of course. Mm -hmm. And I am here to tell some of those stories. Yeah, if you're mm -hmm. in the UK, we will find a history for you to look up. Oh my gosh, involved. yeah. Go with whatever is local to you, unless mm -hmm. you like to really travel. But local is a good place to start. Yeah, it's a good place to start. Even out west, there's gold rush people that do that stuff. Mm-hmm. You know, if you want to play Zorro, go play Zorro. <laughs> I like UK history because I'm obsessed with anything to do with Henry VIII. I love Anne Boleyn. She's my favorite character from history. I've seen every single documentary, every single movie that has Anne in it. But I have yet to go to the UK, so someday I would like to go. <laughs> yeah. Maybe one day we'll go. That'd be we'll have to see George Washington's house, his family's house. All he cares about is American history. America. Look where I'm at. If I was, in, if I lived in London, sure, I'd be wearing a red coat. Oh, by the way, speaking of which, Ron is a red coat no, because I'm not. I figured out that his ancestors came from England. We basically have a reverse uh, I refuse Outlander. To believe it. We have a reverse outlander going on because my ancestors, going back to the 18th century and earlier, are Scottish from my dad's side, and his are British. So we have a reverse outlander. He was an outlander. He would have killed me. Jamie from Scotland <laughs> and Claire from England. Uh huh. We love that show, by the way. He got me into it recently, and we're now at the the last season. Season six. Mhm. Mm so a, we caught up. There's some goofy stuff in there, but it's pretty good overall. The production is top notch. Oh, it's amazing. That's really why I watch it. The acting, the, the acting is amazing. Claire yeah. is beautiful. You're beautiful, er. Oh, thanks. But I don't think anyone's more beautiful than Claire. Uh, <laughs> she really is so beautiful. She's tall and elegant. She's I mean, got a I, slim neck. I mean, I do wish I was buff like him, and I could rip my shirt off and. Be nice looking uh -huh. instead of fat and hairy. Uh, <laughs> well, I wouldn't mind looking like Claire, I guess, but I'm okay with how I look. Claire looks like you. She's got dark hair. Yeah, that's the only thing we share. Well, you're There's prettier. A lot of you're prettier. Dark hair. You're prettier. Thanks, Ron. It's your job to say that, so of course you have to say that. 
Well, I'm in. Oh, really? Well, thanks. <laughs> Thank you, dear. <laughs> I tell her every day and she's like, no. no. Yes, you are. Well, thank you. That's very kind of you. <laughs> you know, true talk. Growing up, I had very bad acne. Very, very bad. Like, I went to so many different doctors for it. 20 of them, maybe? Wow. And it was so bad that one time when I went to the doctor's office, a dermatologist said, hey, I'm writing a, a dermatology textbook. Can I take a picture of your face and possibly use it? So that's how bad it was. That's rude. <laughs> yeah, well, anyway, so uh, I was just raised uh, not thinking I was very attractive because I had very bad acne my well, whole life. You're very beautiful inside. Well, now. thank you, Ron. <clears throat> But true beauty, I realized, is how healthy you are, how you treat others, mm -hmm. emphasis on how healthy you are, because you can be, you could look like Angelina Jolie and have so many health problems mm -hmm. on the inside. She doesn't even look good. She's scary looking. Oh my gosh, stop it. No, have she not looks seen her? good. I think she looks good. Anyway, 20 years ago. Anyway, back to the point. You can... I mean, you can be so beautiful from the outside in terms of the stereotypical looks, but if you're not healthy, if you are miserable physically and mentally, you know, I mean, what is more important to you? I think I'd, I'd rather, uh, I'd rather be beautiful literally on the inside, I guess. You are. <clears throat> and Thank you. bonus chair on top, you're beautiful on the outside. Oh, thanks, Ron. <clears throat> All right. But what even are... if you do have health issues out there, though, it don't mean you're not beautiful. I'm just saying that it you shouldn't be limited by, oh, I was born with a certain thing. Like, I have bad acne. It's in my genes. Therefore, I can't be beautiful. No. Take your own advice. You're beautiful. Thanks. <laughs> you want to talk about that um, duty over there? Oh, yeah. People already forget what it is. We got yeah. a bird bottle. Looks like a vase. Someone me. gave it to us on, on Pioneer Days. A lady who watches our videos, she came up to me and she said, I would like to bless you with some redware. Oh, sorry, one of the chickens is doing something weird outside. She was running. <laughs> she bought it from Candy, didn't yeah, she? Yeah, and I said, no way, really? And she said, yes, I'll buy you whatever you want from Candy store. That's redware. So I picked this out because I've been wanting this for the last year. It's a bird bottle. And what you do is there's a little hole in the back here and you're supposed to attach it to the side of a tree. So this goes outside. Pretend my arm's a tree. It goes out like that. So small. Did a bigger tree than that though. I, what am I supposed to do? Put it on my leg? <laughs> okay, hold up your arm. There we go. Oh my. Oh, there's a tree. There we go. Okay, so anyway. There's your tree, and then you put a twig here so that the bird has something to land on. And then the bird goes in here and builds a nest. And these have, these were super popular in the 18th century, all up until maybe 1840, maybe 1830. And it's amazing because somehow the birds know to build a nest in there. Every single one of these I've ever seen has a nest in it. Candy has one outside of her shop, and there's a nest in it. And I've seen three others at historical houses, and they all have nests in them. It's like they just know instinctively, maybe because they've been around for hundreds of years, that you're, you see this. Here's the hiccups. Oh, yeah, no. I see it. I see I it. I mean, like, I'm saying when the bird sees this, it knows it has to build a nest in here. I wonder what kind of... A small bird. Bird. Oh, like a finch or something. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> Well, we'll hang it up this Yep, week. we'll hang it out outside of our cabin on a tree. It's really nice. Always wanted one of these. Candy sells these. Yeah. In our store. Oh man, Ron has the hiccups. Dang it. <laughs> Dang it. I get it when I eat too fast. Well, there you go. Did you learn your lesson? No. Yes. <laughs> also, thank you to everybody <laughs> who watched the ice cream uh, video last week. That was... Uh, Quite entertaining with the the violins and stuff. Entertaining for him. And then who? Not for me. And thank you to everybody that watched the uh, mm -hmm. us tasting it. That was 
That was good. I, I paid for it afterwards. I felt really bad. <laughs> but it, it tasted so it good. It got quite windy in here, if you know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> but it was good. Mm -hmm. It was good. No, all of our bread's gone. <clears throat> And it was very simple. It's not gone. You want to see a magic trick? Yeah. Ready? And? Where did that come from? I'm not complaining. <laughs> make me some of this gravy. Can I have one? Yes. I like brown gravy. Ron likes more white gravy. I like all gravy. <laughs> Look but at that. you definitely like white gravy more. Every time we go somewhere to eat, you always get white gravy. Not all the time. Hmm. And if they have it, I'll get it. It's not true. <laughs> <laughs> I like the chicken gravy. I've too. never seen him order anything. I brown like gravy beef ever. gravy, chicken gravy, <laughs> and milk gravy. Hmm. Delicious. Mm -hmm. This is really good. This one is going to be part of our permanent food rotation. On the menu. Mm -hmm. It's a once a month kind of dish. You look good. <laughs> I feel like I've matched the, <laughs> I mean, yeah, this is a little more orange and that's more red, but I mean. Well, it's a on. nice tablecloth, so that's not an insult, really. <laughs> you look great. If you say so. <laughs> See, you're you're telling me that I look great and I don't believe it, and then I'm telling you you look great and you don't believe it. But you're not wearing a rug. <laughs> well, when you put it like that. I'm sure back then there were instances of women getting men's shirts and stuff that they didn't like, just like today. Oh, yeah. Hon, I got you this new shirt. I got oh. you this new dress. Oh. <laughs> Thanks, honey. I got you an ice cream maker. Oh. You feel... You were excited about getting a new dress, though. So. <clears throat> what about like? the ice cream maker? You liked the ice cream, didn't you? Yeah, I like the ice cream. <laughs> I didn't like making it. Mm. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't fun. <laughs> so there's mushroom catsup in this. Oh yeah. The receipt says to add catsup. If we're talking about any recipe that's pre-1840, that means mushroom catsup. Mm. Just like nowadays, if you see a recipe in a cookbook that says add ketchup, it automatically means tomato ketchup. Back then, it automatically meant mushroom ketchup. Yeah. Ketchup doesn't necessarily mean it's made of tomatoes, but nope. in our time period, that's what we associate it with. <laughs> right. How would you describe the flavor of it, of the mushroom ketchup? Mm. Like a really thin... A1 steak sauce. A thin A1 steak sauce with a, a little <laughs> dash of soy sauce in it. Or Worcestershire. Or all three. Mm hmm It's good. Just get some and try it. Then you'll know. Mm hmm Got the savory bread pudding going on here. Yeah, it's like a bread <laughs> pudding. <clears throat> That looks pretty good. It looks like a gravy French toast, what he's yeah. got going on. <laughs> it is good. Very good. <laughs> I can't believe how much meat we just ate, though. There's still another pizza. You want it? I'm full. No, I'll take it. Boy, we just ate a lot of meat. <laughs> There's a piece. Mm. Throw the bread in there and mm. oh, we're not just saying this stuff's good. Oh, it's good. I mean, we don't just 
eat it here and that's the end of it. Off, I mean, when I say this is going to be part of our rotation, I mean it. We'll make it once a month because it's that good. Still, my favorite thing I've ever tried was the venison pie. Okay. So that's probably because it was mainly my own recipe, that one. <laughs> so that's why it was good. Just because I didn't have to stick to someone else's mm -hmm. recipe. <clears throat> so I could play around with it a little bit. I used things that were all seasonal, things that were all very common in meat pies at the time. But it was my own mixing upping that I did. It was delicious. Mm -hmm. But this is still really good. Oh yeah. This is in the top five. How about that? The apples and sausages is also in the top five. Yeah, that looks good too. Mm -hmm. The chicken with the bacon and the pie from two weeks ago. He liked that, wow. but for me that's not my top five. <laughs> it was really good, don't get me wrong, but it just didn't agree with my personal palate. I don't like super, super heavy, mm -hmm. buttery, creamy foods like that. So for me, I just, it was good, but I can only eat that once a year. It, it was week. rich. It was good. It had bacon, cream, and butter in it. It was just really, really rich. I mean, that's how you get gout. <laughs> <laughs> My favorite dessert that you make is probably those little heart cakes. Oh, I do like the heart cakes. Those are good. Oh, yeah. And also a little bit of an announcement. Uh oh. Uh oh. Do I know about this? Yeah, you do. I do? <laughs> so starting in June. Whenever an event is available in our area, I'm going to start having a ye old fashioned 1820s bake sale. <laughs> so whenever there's a reenactment, we're going to set up a tent and I'm going to actually sell the baked goods that I've made on my channel before using 100% what it says to do in the receipt. 100%. I'm not going to add any baking soda, any baking flour. I'm not going to add any margarine or any modern weird no. stuff. I'm literally just going to bake it exactly like how it says to do. So it's going to be 1820s food and earlier. I'm going to do probably 1780 to 1825 at the latest. And we're going to set up a tent and sell it. It's yep. going to be like a 200 year old bake sale. And we might offer tea. And we might offer tea as well. Because at events there's plenty of concessions mm -hmm. of nachos and chicken and all that. It's but not historically accurate. Nobody food. does anything historic. Right. And that's what made me want to do it is because whenever I would go to these reenactments and rendezvous, people would be selling foods like chicken and dumplings, burgers, hot chips, dogs. hot dogs, things like that. But funnel cakes. funnel cakes, but honestly, that's not peri correct food. Um, at least not for, I mean, these are 18th and early 19th century events. If we're doing like eight, if we're doing 1900, maybe, yeah, but fair food. yeah, but not, not colonial food. So I actually want to sell food that's peri correct. And that's what I'm going to do. Yeah. And, um, uh, for sure, we're going to do it at the Fort Duchard events. We're gonna do it at the Old Mine events. We're gonna do it at Pioneer Days starting next year. And any event that's within two hours, you know, I'm, I'm willing to do that. Yep. And I thought about selling them online as well, maybe on Etsy, but Ron gave me a good point that it's not going to be fresh. <laughs> if, it's really hard to ship baked food and I want to keep the price really, really low because it's just a cookie, you know? I don't want to charge $10 for a cookie. So I'm, I'm going to keep it the price really low, but I'm only going to sell in person because if I do ship it online on Etsy or whatnot, then it might get to you broken up in pieces, all crumbled up. It might be stale, and I just don't want you to go through that experience. I'm sorry. <laughs> so you're just going to have to see me. What can yep. I say? <laughs> 
And uh, we'll share whenever we go to an event. We'll post about it so you guys know that we'll be there. And we'll have a ye old bake sale so we can Yield. afford land and build a house on it. Yeah. It's a bake sale so we can afford land. And for sure, I already know for sure some of the things I'm going to sell. I'm going to sell heart cakes because Ron knows I'm obsessed with those. They're so good. I'm going to sell Queen's Cakes, which were the most popular dessert without a doubt from about 1700 until 1840. That was the most popular dessert in Europe and America. And they're like muffins, but they have dried currants in them. And for some reason, that was the most popular dessert, but they're really, really, really good. That's why they're popular. Yep. And I'm also going to sell pound cakes as they were back then. Um, they're going to look better than the ones I made in my video because I learned a few things since then. They still are going to taste the same, but I'm going to, I'm going to cook it in a cast iron mold so that they, the, the batter doesn't run off in any direction. It just makes it look prettier. It'll taste the same, but it makes it look prettier. And I'm going to sell caraway seed pound cakes, lemon seed pound cakes, and cinnamon pound cakes. You said lemon seed? No, caraway seed pound cakes, lemon pound cakes, and cinnamon pound cakes. Either from That's a, a lot of stuff. That, we're up to five things. When we're out, we're out. <laughs> yeah, we're up to five things. And then I Corn also. No. Okay. And then I'm also going to sell uh, funeral cookies from an 1820s receipt because that's just cool. <laughs> Sounds like a blast. Sounds like a blast. Give me, them, uh, give me three funeral cookies. <laughs> give me three funeral cookies. They are cookies that would have been given out at wakes <laughs> back in the day. The chocolate ones we did were good, but those were... Those are difficult. good and they're really easy to make, but they're super sugary and I don't think that they'll agree with a modern, a modern palate. Mm. So I'm picking things that are good, but also I think will work with anyone you know like you can just eat it some guy off the street can eat it and will say oh that's really good not some guy who has to be a history enthusiast might enjoy it yeah. but just anyone can enjoy it so i'm picking out baked goods that i know are actually delicious and uh so yeah that's what i'm gonna do start in june <laughs> i'm actually really excited about that i've been daydreaming about what i want my tent to look like and everything i want to make and all that. I'm excited. Good. Yeah. So Pioneer Days for sure, I'm going to be selling it there. Well, I'm excited. This rain's slowing down. It is. Thank goodness. It's time to get back to work. No. <laughs> yeah, we do have some chores we got to do around here today. And the food's gone, mostly. I mean, all the meat's gone. Yeah, it's your day for dishes. It's my day for dishes. That's one of the chores we got to do. I gotta cut wood. Now I got bits of fence. Mm -hmm. So anyway, guys, thank you for watching. Like always, we always appreciate your company. So thank you so much. Thanks to everyone who came down for Pioneer Days. Yeah. And even if you couldn't make it, thank you for even thinking about it. And thank you just for being our friends. We appreciate it so much. You guys don't even know. You all take care and you have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.